Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's great to welcome you back to the after lunch session of the uh, DSF 2021. Um, it's my great pleasure to be able to introduce Adam Gaitowski uh, from the Financial Times. He's going to be talking about using hybrid recommender systems to personalize Financial Times push notifications. Um, before his current role as a data scientist for the Financial Times, he did his undergraduate in uh, economics and econometrics at Nottingham, and then a master's in statistics at Warwick. So, Adam, would you like to take the floor? Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending my talk. My name is Adam Jaitkowski. I'm a data scientist at the Financial Times. Today's talk will focus on describing the Financial Times hybrid recommender system, which we used for personalizing push notifications. During this talk, I will explain how we used various unsupervised and supervised machine learning techniques to create a hybrid recommender model, how we dealt with uncertainty caused by unsupervised machine learning, and how data science models developed during Hackathon can deliver surprisingly good results. Financial Times is a digital subscription business. More than 80% of our customers are digital, and only a tiny fraction of them actually purchase the newspaper. Our competitors include The Economist, Apple News, Bloomberg, and these are our direct competitors, but we actually also need to compete with the companies such as Netflix, Amazon, or even, or even Facebook, and we compete with those companies for user attention. So attention of our users is limited, and when they decide to spend their time on a digital uh, entertainment, they, to some extent, they need to decide between Financial Times, Netflix, or Amazon Prime. And hopefully that justifies the need for the data science team within the FT. And in order to be on a competitive side of this competition with those companies, we need to improve user experience of our customers. And how do we measure this user experience within the FT? We use engagement metrics similar to, uh, similar to other companies who presented here today. Our engagement metrics includes three aspects. This, first of all, it is recency. So we look when was the last time when our users have visited our website or our application, then frequency. So within a particular period of time, how many visits they had. And lastly, we measure volume, so how many pages they have browsed within this uh, particular period of time. And this is a quote from our former chief product officer, Kate Odorian. The best way to increase reader numbers and reduce customer churn is to focus on engagement. So when we develop products within the data science team, we always have engagement and user experience in mind. And this slide shows the basic business model of the FT. So we are digital subscription business, and we rely on recurring purchases of our products. And the greater user experience, the greater engagement, and the higher amount of recurring purchases. And then those recurring purchases results in increased lifetime value. Lifetime value is another North Star metric for the digital, digital subscription business, which measures the discounted contributions of users to our company. And the higher number of recurring purchases of products, the higher in lifetime value. And then once we increase the lifetime value of our customers, this results in higher revenue for the Financial Times and hopefully higher profits. And we started this project as a hackathon idea. And we had those engagement lifetime value, and the subscription business model in mind. So this project started as a four-week hackathon. The project was a cross-disciplinary collaboration between data scientists, software engineers, product managers, and business analysts. The overall aim of this project was to obviously increase the profits at the, of the FT, but at the same time, we wanted to utilize skills of all our team members, so both business analysts, software engineers, data scientists. We didn't really want to, this project to be a purely data science focused. And then, first of all, we compiled a list of ideas of what are the things which we're interested in and things which potentially can contribute to the profit of the FT. And in, this, in the end, we decided to create a recommender 
system. And then you may say, all right, but like recommender system, it's not really you know, original. Like there are already many recommender systems, not only within the FT, but also within the business. So like why do we want to create a recommender system? And actually for the purpose of this particular project, we wanted to create a novel recommender system which doesn't exactly uh, target accuracy, but it targets the, uh, it exposes customers to a breadth of topics which is published within the FT. So here we have the three desirable properties for the push application recommender system which we have designed. First of all, we wanted to expose customers to new topics. During our previous analysis, we saw that the breadth of reading, so the fact that users are reading across multiple topics of, of the FT, they're not only focused on one particular pro uh, topic, this breadth of reading is negatively correlated to churn. So the higher the breadth of reading, the more topics our users browse, then in the long term, the less likely they are to churn. But at the same time, we wanted to still surface somehow relevant content. So we didn't really want it to surface some random articles just for the sake of breadth of reading, but we wanted to keep those uh, articles somehow relevant. And finally, the last desirable property was keeping customers up to date, and I guess that's kind of the aim of most uh, push re notifications recommender systems. So having those three desirable properties in mind, we started our research. Broadly, we can divide recommender system into three main categories. Collaborative filtering, content-based filtering, and then we have hybrid recommender systems. First of all, let's discuss collaborative filtering. Collaborative filtering relies on the similarity of users' history. So let's say we have two users. We have purple user and we have a blue user. Purple user has read the... Uh, well. This, this should be green, red, and blue article, and then the blue user has read only green and red article. And based on that, we can say that they have similar reading history, and we would, that's why we group those users together, and then we would recommend the blue article to the blue user just because the purple user has read all these three articles. The next type of recommender system is a content-based recommender system, which you can see here and there. So the content-based recommender system works on a user level, and here remember that the collaborative filtering recommender system works on a all users' uh, history level. So for, for the content-based recommender system, we simply look at the user's reading history, we look at the topics which they have read and the type of articles which they have read, and we simply surface articles which are similar uh, to those which they have read in the past. And then hybrid recommender system are some combinations of those two recommender systems, but they also include like reinforcement learning recommender systems, which rely both on a user level history and the hist uh, history, reading history of all users. And actually you can see that there's a problem when we look at those, at least those first two recommender systems. They create an echo chamber, which means that we purely recommend articles which the users have already read and have I and prefer, or the articles that sim users similar to those particular users has read. And that's why we needed to take, to take another approach to designing this recommender system. And this is the very high level overview of how the recommender system developed within the FT works. So we use four models which we have developed in the past before the hackathon in order to surface recommendation to our users. First of all, we use article vectorization. Article vectorization represents each article as a column vector, and this allows us to automatically group the articles. Then we use unsupervised machine learning, uh, and in particular clustering, which takes these article vectors as an input and groups them based on the similarity in content. Next, we map user page views to the clusters developed by the unsupervised machine learning, and we use a Bayesian shrinkage model to account for the preferences of, for the real preferences of our uh, users, and we'll go into detail of this model later on. And finally, we use breadth of reading metric to, surf, uh, to surface relevant recommendation to our users. So what breadth of reading metric does, it basically, it is another metric which allows us to 
quantify the rigging habits of our users. So this, this metric allows us to say whether our users are broad readers or narrow readers, so whether they read across multiple topics or a particular topic. And depending on their reading habits, then we surface either articles which match their reading habits closely or, a bit, or, a, or, a bit, or are a bit more far away from their reading history. And right now, we will discuss all of the elements of this recommender system. This is the architecture of the recommender model, which includes both the deployment methods and the particular jobs, uh, which uh, particular data science and software engineering jobs. And we'll go through this whole diagram bit by bit. So the first element of the recommender system is the article vectorization. First of all, we wanted to use article vectorization because in some sense we wanted to represent articles as a point in space and we didn't really want to rely on tags provided by our journalists because we wanted to surface more unique insights and also representing article as a point in space allowed us to surface either articles which, are, which match preferences of our users quite closely or are, or are a bit more far away from their preferences but are still relevant. And article vectorizations exactly allowed us to do that. So broadly speaking, you can see that article vectorization takes a text as an input and then outputs the column uh, vector, which includes the information about the content of this article. So it includes information about the uh, keywords, uh, the reading, uh, the style of the article, or the, in, general, in general, the content of the article. And before we started article vectorization, we have considered several simple approaches, TF, IDF, one hot encoding, word embedding, transformers, the recurrent neural network. And in the end, we have decided to use the paragraph representation, which is an extension of the word embeddings library. And when we were selecting the model, we had really a four desirable properties in mind. So first of all, we wanted our model to be flexible. We wanted to be able to vectorize all types of articles. Then we wanted our model to be easily available uh, as a library just because the time limit for, our, uh, for this hackathon project was quite limited and we didn't really have weeks to like train the model and then test different architectures of the model. Next, we wanted our model to have quite good performance relative to our model, and I guess that is like quite obvious. And finally, we wanted our model to be as simple as possible, both in terms of architecture and in terms of hyperparameters to tune, just because it was hackathon project with a limited amount of time. And just based on that, that's the main reason why we have chosen the paragraph vectorization. And this slide shows the basic idea of the paragraph vectorization. This model comes from the Mikolov et al. paper from 2014, and the paper is titled Efficient Estimation of Word Representation in the Vector Space. So what the model does is basically WT stands for a word T, WT1, WT minus 2 stands for two words before it, and then WT plus 1, WT plus 2 stands for like the words next to a given word. And this model transformed the text into a supervised machine learning problem where we take a given word as an input, and then we tried to predict the surrounding words next to this word, W, T. And based on that, we modeled the probabilities that a given word will occur next to each other, and that's how we later on represent a given text as a column vector. And you may ask, all right, but actually, like, you have articles. You don't really use article tags. So how did you tune this model, and how did you validate it that it actually works? And as I mentioned earlier, one of the desirable properties for our model was simplicity. So we really wanted to keep it as simple as possible. That's why we have chosen this model. And the only three param hyperparameters which we needed to tune is a vector size, number of epoch, and the type of the model, so either this distributed back of words or a skip gram. And we have tuned this model without labels. And actually, uh, yeah, basically, that's how we 
validated this model that it works, and that's how we made sure that uh, the given set of hyperparameters is as good as possible. So firstly, we have chosen a given set of hyper hyperparameters, then we ch have chosen a given distance metric, so in that case we have chosen Euclidean distance to measure the distance between two points of space, so in our case it was 30-dimensional space. Then we computed a whole a distance matrix which measures the distance from a given article to all other articles. And lastly, we filtered those articles which are closest to each other, and we have produced a table, which you can see here. It includes the article ID and URL, and then we had like a pairs of articles. And we have used the annotations in order, uh, so the higher numbers of matching annotations, the higher probability that the model is uh, good. And then we also sampled uh, articles and used uh, manual ratings. So actually, we checked manually whether article with URL 1 and URL 2 like, are somehow similar, not similar, or very similar to each other. So we measured those articles on a scale 1 to 3. So basically, that's how we approached this. Uh, like, really, it is kind of unsupervised machine learning because we really didn't have labels for our articles. So now we can move on to the next element of this recommender model. So right now we have article text which has been vectorized. And the next step in order to surface this broader recommendations to our user is to actually find the groups of articles that are similar to each other in terms of content. And that is this element. And as you know, there are like tens of algorithms which allow us to cluster articles together. So right now, thanks to the fact that we have vectorized these articles, we can somehow measure the distance and find the articles that are similar to each other. And really, first of all, we consider like tens of algorithms for clustering. So for instance, k-means, spam, Diana, Fanny, some model, Sota, Clara, Agnes, and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, we, have on, we had only limited time. We had only four weeks, so we needed to narrow down our research. And also remember that within each of those clustering algorithms, we need to tune a bunch of hyperparameters. So really, it would take ages to do all of this. So what we did was we simply read the academic literature to narrow down our research, and then we read article blog posts from other companies. But in the end, our key metric was interpretability. So we have considered the statistical properties of our clustering algorithms once we narrow it down. So for instance, these were the shithole plots or like the Dan index, which basically measures like how closely within each cluster, how closely, how close are articles to each other and how separate are clusters to each other. But this allowed us only to narrow down our research a bit. And then the last step was actually, again, validating those clusters manually. So based on our stakeholder feedback, we have come up with a 30 clusters, and the next stage was actually developing a web app which allowed us to visualize the articles within each cluster. So we have created a word clouds, we have created a list of most popular articles within each cluster, and together with our stakeholders, we checked that actually those clusters make sense both for us and for our customers. And that is really the way we tackled the unsupervised machine learning problem, both in terms of article vectorization and article clustering. So the outcome of this research was actually just 30 clusters, 30 points in space, which represented the groups of articles. But as you may imagine, like we are the news agency, and as we go on, the news agenda changes, and also the new content emerges organically over time. And that means that, well, our clusters may become over, or irrelevant over, over after some time. And that is the reason why we have decided to develop another model, which is called reclustering. So reclustering model allows us to keep our groups of articles up to date. And this slide represents the basic idea behind the article clusters. So in that case, in our case, we have we mapped articles into 30-dimensional space, but for the sake of presentation, here we present it as a two-dimensional uh, space. So each point represents the medoid, which defines the center, 
of which defines the article, which is the most central with the lowest distance to all other articles within the cluster. Then based on analysis, we have derived a threshold. Uh, and then if the newly published articles, which is this red dot in that case, falls within this uh, threshold, then we simply assign it to the existing article. But if it is outside the threshold, then we create a new cluster, which is defined by exactly that point. And in case, so as you may imagine, we uh, publish like 100, 150 articles every day. And sometimes it may happen that actually we have a couple of points outside those thresholds. So in that case, we run the reclustering algorithm, and then we try to find, cluster those points together. But if they do not cluster well, which means that if they're quite far away from each other, we simply define them as a separate clusters. And that is the workflow of this project. So first of all, new article is published in, in our system AWS Lambda, and we vectorize this article and assign it to the existing cluster. Then we recluster measure, then we reclustering measures the distance from Medoid to a newly published article. And if the article is above threshold, uh, we create a new cluster and define the module of this new cluster. And then the last step is actually communication with our stakeholders. So what we do is we send a Slack notification, and then we use some simple NLP techniques, such as TF-IDF, in order to suggest the name of the cluster. So this allows us to keep our groups of articles up to date. And this is a crucial element of this recommender system. The third element is Bayesian shrinkage model. And before I start describing this model, let's start with an example. Let's imagine we have two users. We have user A and we have user B. User A has just recently joined the FT and they have read four out of four articles about lifestyle. So the ratio that they have preference for the lifestyle section is one. And then we have our user B who has joined the FT also two weeks ago, but they have read eight out of 10 articles about lifestyle. So in that case, the ratio is 0.8. Eight, which approximates their preferences for a given article. And actually, like when we compare ratios, we would say that user A has much stronger preference for lifestyle section than user B. But you can see that the strength of evidence, the volume, is much higher for user B. So that's what the Bayesian shrinkage model actually tries to do. It tries to account for the evidence of the real preferences of a user for a particular group of articles. And we have used the Bayesian theorem in order to account for it. So what we do is we try to feed the, we feed beta distribution, which represents the overall preferences of users for a particular groups of articles within the FT. And we do that on all registered user cohort. We take the 14 days of page views, then we feed the distribution and get for our expectations. And then if the evidence that a user has preference for a particular group of articles is low, we move the ratios more towards the overall population mean. But if their evidence is high, then it stays very similar uh, to the original one. And that is just the formula, which so shows you how we use the Bayesian theorem. So we have, uh, in that case, Q is probability of success, which is unknown. S is number of successes. F is number of failures. N is number of trials. Alpha, beta parameters are the prior parameters which we try to fit, then x is a random variable, and b is a beta function, which is normalizing constant. So we have used beta as our prior distribution, just because it is a conjugate prior, which means that then when we use Bayesian theory, it simplifies to the same distribution family as our prior distribution. And then our likelihood, uh, which is our evidence, is a Bernoulli distribution. So here you can see how it simplifies really nicely. We simply add alpha and beta parameters to this formula, so the computa computational efficiency is quite high. And that brings us to almost last element of our model. So right now, we have vectorized articles. We have uh, grouped articles into uh, similar clusters. And we have mapped articles page views into a particular groups of articles and accounted for the evidence. And right now, we need to decide which articles should we actually recommend to our users, whether we should recommend articles that match their preferences quite closely, or whether we should uh, recommend articles which are quite far away from their prefer preferences. And for that, because of that, we have developed another 
metric, which is called a breadth of reading metric. So breadth of reading metric ranges between zero and one. Zero means that, or scores close to zero means that users are fo highly focused on a particular section of the FT. So for instance, they read news only about like finance, or they read news only about like hedge funds, but they're highly focused around this financial aspect of the FT. And then scores quite uh, close to one means that users are reading like broadly ac across all topics, all FT topics. So for instance, they read about finance, lifestyle, travel, and like personal finance uh, section. And as I mentioned in the beginning, one of the reasons why we wanted to develop this model is because we wanted to retain customers in a long run. So we wanted to recommend articles which are not that close to their preferences, but are still somehow relevant. And the breadth of reading metrics allows us to determine their reading habit. And then if they have quite narrow preferences, then we recommend the broad article, which is quite far away from the reading preferences. But if they're already reading crowd world broadly, then we want to focus them engaged in a short term. And we focus, we recommend the article, which is very close to their preferences. And in order to compute the breadth of reading metric, we have actually reused a paper from Anderson et al., which was published in 2020. And the title of this paper is called Algorithmic Effect on the Diversity of Consumption on Spotify. And this metric consists of two elements. First of all, we have mu i. Mu i uh, includes uh, two variables. So we have variable wj. Wj is a weight assigned to a given article. And then we have SJ, which represents a column vector of a particular article. And as we assign equal weights for each article, so what mu i is, is actually the average preference of our users. So we average across all column vector in order to compute the mu i. And the next element is actually computing the generic specialist score, which, are relate, which is related to our breadth of reading uh, model. And the generic specialist score uh, simply computes the it is the average of the dot product of an article uh, sj and uh, mu i, which is the center of preferences of our users, divided by the norm of uh, article vector and the norm of the center of preferences of our users. And I think it is more simple just to visualize this formula. So here, again, our articles are mapped into 30 dimensions, but in that case, we, just for the sake of presentation, we have mapped them into a three-dimensional space. So we have x, y, z axis, in case you cannot see that clearly. But the basic idea behind this, here on the left-hand side, you can see that each of those blue dots represents the article mapped in, as a point in space. Then we find the average preferences of our users, which are represented by this red dot in the middle. So this is average of all column vectors of our articles. And the last step is computing the average distance between each of the, our published articles and the center preference of a particular user. And we compute the breadth of reading metric on a user level. And this pseudometric allows us to approximate the user preferences. And this brings us to the slide which summarizes this model. So here you can see how this model, how this model fits together. And so we vectorize articles, then we assign articles to clusters, and then we load those data to the big query. Next, we take the user's reading history in the past uh, two weeks. Then we derive alpha and beta parameter for the uh, beta distribution, which we use as a prior expectations for preferences for a given particular clusters. We also compute the breadth of reading metric using that 90 days user reading history. We merge all those models together, and then we come up with the uh, recommended uh, cluster. So our models only produce recommended cluster. And then we move on to the engineering side of things, which is highlighted in this uh, bright uh, green color. So on the engineering side, we create a snapshot of users reading history, and we filter out all articles which users has recently, uh, have recently read. And then we come up with the most popular articles for a particular cluster. And this is all happening in, in a low memory uh, data, database called DB. And then depending whether the far or new cluster has been recommended, 
we send this article to the app article recommendations through the app's API. And in terms of deployment methods, we have used both batch deployment and API uh, deployment. So we have used AWS Lambda and uh, Content API. And what AWS Lambda does, it scans for newly published article every five minutes. And then if it detects a newly published article, it uses preloaded model trained in uh, Python in Genzyme library in order to vectorize this article. And then it measures the distance between each cluster and article, and then assigns particular article to the nearest uh, cluster. And this is all loaded to the big query. Next, we use our Studio Connect server, which is located in the Google Cloud Platform. So this is another batch deployment. And this batch deployment works every 24 hours. And it computes recommended clusters. And it computes the breadth of reading metric for all registered users. And yeah, finally, we use the app's API just to surface those recommendations to our users. So as I mentioned in the beginning, the main purpose of this model was to surface recommendations via push notifications. And, to, and we hypothesized that it will increase the breadth of reading in, of our users, which in the long term will reduce the churn. But actually, we conducted the A-B test over four weeks, so we couldn't really measure the impact of this model on engagement or, or churn, just because it's too short period of time. But you can see that these were the immediate effects of this model, which were, well, much better than we expected. So the model has increased the push notifications click-through rate by 30% with the high confidence. It increased the content consumption by 27% and visits by 18% relative to previous recommender system, which we had in place. So summing up, this project show how hackathon ideas can transform into real models and that using more risky unsupervised machine learning algorithms can actually produce surprising results. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. That's a really interesting talk. Um, so we've got some questions I'd like to start with over at the back there. Let's read out. And then So the way we compared performance of our models was simply by like matching the, you mean in statistical sense or in terms of results? In terms of results. So yeah, the way we compared our models was simply by like looking at it like and like measuring the number of matching annotations and the manual rating, the goodness of fit. So actually like the uh, simple models such as uh, the TF-IDF or like one hot encoding didn't perform that well just because the text we, which we publish even after the pre-processing, like it is still not very representative of a given article. So I mean, the simple answer is it, they didn't perform very well. So we, we were not satisfied and I think we wouldn't get as good results as we got with this uh, model. Usually we found that those articles were like not very similar to each other and we couldn't even find like similarities in terms of keywords, which would be like the very basic similarity, especially if you count the frequency of words within each uh, article. Uh, so yeah, the answer is like just paragraph vectorization was yeah much better. <laughs> So yeah, we map page views for into clusters, and then we compute the ratios of like what is the ratio of like page views within particular clusters relative to all other clusters, and then we define the near cluster as the cluster with the highest ratio of page views, and then the far cluster as the cluster with the second highest of page views. So basically, it works on like ratios, which are then adjusted using the Bayesian uh, shrinkage model. And then within that cluster, we obviously have like lots of articles. So on the engineering side, they rank, they filtered out already read articles and then rank those articles based on popularity. Just like because one of the desirable properties for this model was that it is quite like recent and usually like more recent articles are more popular. And just that's the reason why we decided to use this uh, logic. For 
clustering. Oh, it's very quick. So like it's instant, basically, because like the model is already trained. So we only use a six, uh, fixed weights in order to vectorize article, and then like assigning articles to clusters is also very fixed because like it simply works based on a Euclidean distance, which like you know it's very fast to compute and like rank. And also we have limited amount of clusters. So right now we started with 30 clusters, but like new clusters started to emerge. So I think right now we have 33 clusters. So it's very fast to kind of compute, for instance, we publish 150 new articles maxima per day. So for those 150 articles, we measure the, you could, we vectorize those articles, it's happening instantly, and then we vectorize those articles. I mean, then we compute the Euclidean distance between, so 30 clusters and 150 articles, and it works like, yeah, basically very fast. And so what would you, could you use it on the website, for example? Mm -hmm. We, so right now we want to test it, on the website, but for that we need to create another API, and this is, I think, more like engineering question. So, like in terms of data science model, it works very fast, but we face some challenges with like actually deploying this recommender system on the website. And I think on our side it works quite fast, but it is just a matter of like ML ops, I guess, in order to come up with solution of how to take the Article, the recommended articles from the big query and surface them to our users on the website. But yeah, I mean, yeah, it's still in work in progress. First so far, we just use it as a push notifications. Another question here. Yeah, thanks for the talk. And I just wondered if you do any optimization around such micro or 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 but just recommendations derived by our model are just a part of the push notifications. So I think we, I can even show it on this slide. Yeah, so we can see that here we have both like breaking news, featured story. So like our notifications are placed only really like small part in uh, the whole push notification uh, system. So like we also want to surface content which is like highly relevant for all of our users and then for instance if there's some breaking story so for instance China declares crypto all crypto currencies activities are illegal so then obviously our editors would decide to like surface this story as a push notification rather than the output of our model so like i would say the output of this recommender system is like default but if there's something more interesting then obviously editorial people have preference like uh, they have priority over our outputs This no, one. Uh, like where you would rate versus the, uh, uh, yeah. Here. So how do you actually measure these the three metrics in comparison to the standard collaborative system? Like uh, the model actually performs better in these three metrics or just overall? So yeah, unfortunately we were not able to measure that churn at that point because our A B test ran only for four weeks and actually the standard subscription like renews every 28 days, so we were on, only able to, sorry, to measure the short-term effects of this model. So even we were not able to measure the effects of this model on engagement, just because the engagement metric is computed over 91 days in case of the FT. So yes, so the results which I presented are only relevant for those uh, as a short-term kind of indicators. Okay, so we've got another question there. Mm -hmm. Sorry? Did you track whether anybody switched off push notifications? Yeah, we have quite a lot of users who switched off the uh, push notifications. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, like, I, I, yeah, I don't remember the exact number, but yes. <laughs> it is not the case that everyone who have installed our app have push notifications switched on, because like, probably as you're aware, like, we have lots of applications on our smartphone, and if we allow for the push notifications from everywhere, then yeah, it would be basically a mess. <laughs> uh, I think we have time for one last question down the front here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it was just really simple algorithm created like within a short period of time. So we simply use the TF-IDF and the article tags in order to, and then, so once the new cluster is published, is published then we look what are the articles within, within these clusters, and then 
each cluster before it's being published, like journalists manually assign the tags to this article, and then we simply suggest the uh, name for this cluster using the uh, number of overlapping uh, tags. So like, yeah, maybe using NLP is a bit overstatement for this. <laughs> but, <laughs> No, no, no. So, like, it is because at the end of the day, our stakeholders need to manually look into these clusters just because the number of clusters which we have created is uh, limited. So, it is, it is just a suggested name, like, as you said. But at the end of the day, we would expect our journalists, or, well, editorial stakeholders to actually look into this cluster and, like, name it or, like, at least make sure that it is consistent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. That would be the same. That is just something so that we don't have just like cluster ID because that would be a bit like dry message for our stakeholders. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's uh, thank Adam again.